Hey everybody, welcome to the channel, True Crime Stories. If you're new to the channel, please hit that like button and subscribe so you can hear more. Thanks for stopping by. Brooklyn Farthing went missing from Berea, Kentucky from the 100 block of Dillon Court on June the 22nd, 2013. She was 18 years old and last known to be wearing a gray t-shirt with the Madison County FAA logo and a pair of light blue jeans. At the time of her disappearance, she was 5 foot 1 and 105 pounds. She had shoulder length blonde hair and brown eyes. Both of her ears are pierced, and she has a birthmark on her left thigh. Brooklyn Farthing was born August 26, 1994. She lived in Berea, Kentucky with her mother, Shelby Walker, and her stepfather, Randall Walker, two sisters, Tasha Thomas and Paige Farthing. Growing up, Brooklyn was a Girl Scout and a member of the organization for the majority of her life. While a, while a member, she made care kits for those affected by Hurricane Katrina. She visited the elderly and spent a lot of time helping others. She was spunky and energetic and loved animals, and she loved the outdoors. She was very good at athletics and was, just, and was described as a tell-it-like-it-is type of person. She had an interest in baking and would spend a lot of her nights baking brownies for her family. At the time of her disappearance, Brooklyn Farthing was 18 years old and living in Berea, Kentucky. She had just graduated from high school in 2013 and was still deciding what she wanted to do. She didn't know if she wanted to go to college or not. According to her family, she loved doing her hair and always seemed to love having her makeup done. She was thinking about going to cosmetology school. Brooklyn was extremely close with her family, especially her sisters. She could often be found riding her four-wheeler or going fishing. She was really laid back. She was a social butterfly, but she was very down-to-earth, and everyone that knew her really liked her. On June the 21st, 2013, the day before Brooklyn went missing, Brooklyn and her sister took her driving tests. Brooklyn passed, but her sister did not. It became a joke in the family all that day. That evening, Brooklyn attended her grandfather's 70th birthday party and her, with her family. Later that evening, Brooklyn and Paige went out to attend a birthday party uh, with their cousin. Around 8 p.m., Paige and her cousin left the party while Brooklyn decided to stay with a friend. Now, in part of this story, Brooklyn had planned to go spend the night with one of her friends and she'd packed an overnight bag and the plan was that they were going to go to this party and after the party was over she was going to go home with her friend but at some point during the night those plans changed and her friend went elsewhere. So Brooklyn had found herself alone at this party and even though she knew most of the people there she didn't really have a ride, and so she starts wandering around, and she runs into this guy that she was friends with. I didn't see his name anywhere, and if his name is out there, I never did find it. Someone else may know a link to another story with his name, but basically he was also someone who was also stuck at this party, or at least that's what he told her. So the two of them were apparently asking around if anyone there could give them a ride, and I guess they were overheard asking for a ride or this guy named Joshua Hensley just happened to be there. Now, he was older than they were. The, Brooklyn was 18, and most of the people at this party were around that age range, maybe a, a year or two difference. This guy was a little older. Anyway, he was there, and he offers to give them a ride home. 
But he tells uh, that this guy, this Josh Hensley, said he had to go check on some horses on this property. They go out there and they check on these horses. And then he takes the guy home. Now, instead of him taking her home or dropping her off at a family member's home, he ends up taking her out here to this house where he supposedly lived. But now it turned out that this place was in foreclosure. Uh, there was no electricity. There was no running water. And I think that most people can conclude the same that I did, that he took her there knowing this and knowing that she would be out there stuck. And if her cell phone should die, she would have no way to charge it because there was no electricity. At approximately 4 a.m., Brooklyn calls Paige to ask if their cousin could come pick her up. Unfortunately, their cousin had been drinking and was unable to come pick her up. So at this point, Brooklyn really wanted to leave. So she calls up her ex-boyfriend and she's, she's like just texting him, please come, I'm scared, please hurry. He's telling her, I get off work at 7 a.m. I'll come pick you up just as soon as I get off work. Now, at around 5.30 that morning, he gets one final text from Brooklyn that says, Don't bother to come. I found a ride. Everything's fine. I'm going to Rockcastle County. And just pretty much tells him, I found a ride home. Everything's okay. Now, in hindsight, we, we know that this probably was not Brooklyn texting him. This was the man because at around 5.00, 4.30, she texts him and says, please hurry, please hurry, I'm scared. This would be Brooklyn's last communication. This would be the last time anyone heard from her. Now, at 7 o'clock that morning, Josh Hensley arrives back at his home after he says he got up at 5.30 a.m. and Brooklyn was still there at that point, sitting on his couch smoking a cigarette. He tells her, I've got to go check on these horses. Now, she wanted out of this house so badly that she was texting her ex-boyfriend at his work. Please come get me. Please come get me. And this guy gets up at 530 and says, I'm going to go back out here and check on the horses. But he claims that he went and checked on these horses. He's gone about an hour and a half and he arrives back at his house at 7 a.m. Now, we know in hindsight, again, he was probably trying to burn this couch to get rid of DNA. He he had probably, more than likely, he had probably raped her, strangled her on this couch, or, or possibly stabbed her. I would say more than likely he, he strangled her or suffocated her in the process of raping her. And he's trying to get rid of DNA from this couch. Now, it was known by Brooklyn's family and friends that she had already made plans for the following day to go to Somerset, Kentucky, to a car show with some friends. This is how people came to start looking for her, because when it got time for everyone to meet up to leave to go to this car show, she was nowhere around. Some people just thought that maybe because she'd gotten upset with her friend the night before, that she just decided not to go, because she was supposed to have went home and spent the night with this girlfriend, and those plans changed. So they start asking, and then her, that's when her family starts calling. They find out that she had gotten a ride from this Josh Hensley, and that's when they start trying to get a hold of him. I wanted to add this after I listened to a podcast yesterday called The Vanished that was about Brooklyn Farthing. I heard her sister talk about this. I think this podcast was back in 2017 and I will provide a link in the comments. But she said that um, during the night around 4 a.m. when Brooke first called her sister Paige and asked if someone could come and pick her up, she didn't appear to be really frantic or frightened or upset. She just wanted to come home. And her sister said, well, you know, our cousin who was there had been drinking and she didn't want to, you know, ask her to get out on the road. She said that she offered to go wake their mother up and see if she would come and pick Brooke up. And Brooke said, no, don't do that. I will just wait until the morning and get a ride home. 
at about 4.30, she starts texting her ex-boyfriend, Jared, and appeared to be more concerned and telling him, please hurry, come and get me. Can you come and get me now? He tells her, I can't leave work. I'll come get you as soon as I get off work. And then at 5.30, he receives one last text, as we know, saying, don't bother to come get me. I'm going to Rockcastle County. Everyone believes that this text, the police and everyone else believes that that last text was sent from someone else. So something happened between 4 a.m. and 4.30 a.m. when she told her sister, it's okay, you don't have to come. She seemed kind of casual about it. And 4.30 a.m. when she's texting her ex-boyfriend saying, please come get me. So later in the day, the next morning, when people start looking for her, they're trying to call her phone. They're not getting in touch with her. They all start calling each other. And the sister gets in touch with someone and they say, yeah, she was at the party. She left with this Josh Hensley. So they call around until they find someone that has this guy's phone number. Now, the older sister, Tasha, she calls this Josh Hensley and says, you know, how do you know Brooke? Uh, was she at your house? So the sister asks this guy, how do you know Brooke? And he says, well, I know her through her ex-boyfriend. I've known her for a couple of years from back when the two of them were together. Um, the sister, none of her friends had ever heard her talk about this guy. They had never heard of him as being as part of her circle of friends. He said, yeah, I gave her a ride home last night. She came out here to my place. But, uh, but when, you know, he tells her the story again about going to feed the horses and not wanting to be there when the ex-boyfriend comes. And he just kind of cleared out, giving this guy time enough to come pick her up. And when he returned to the house, she wasn't there. Now, he, make, he makes no mention in this first conversation about the couch being on fire, about her belongings still being there at the house. So she tells him, you know, well, we can't find her, and everyone's trying to get in touch with her, and you were the last one that saw her. And he says, well, you know, she told me that her ex was coming to pick her up. Maybe you need to check with him. The ex-boyfriend, of course, tells him, yeah, you know, I was at work. So he had that alibi. He was at work. He says, I never went out there to pick her up because I get this text at 5.30 a.m. And I'm sure that he showed these texts to his, you know, to the police. And he just says, you know, that was the last I heard from her. So the older sister who didn't live there in Berea, she lived a little farther away. She informs this Josh Hensley, well, you know, if we don't get in touch with her in the next little while, we're going to be calling the cops because you were the last one to see her and talk to her, and now no one knows where she's at. She informs him that her husband was with the deputy sheriff's office, with, was a deputy in the sheriff's office. I don't think it was Madison County. I think it was a different county, but I think that this kind of put some fear into this Josh Hensley because 30 minutes later, she says he calls her back. And then his story kind of started to change a little bit. This is when he tells her he's freaking, he says, I'm freaking out. I'm worried. I'm upset about all this. She says, well, what's going on? You didn't seem to be too freaked out when I talked to you earlier. He says, well, I just realized that all of her belongings are still here. And she says, what do you mean? He says, well, her purse and her shoes and everything is still here in my house. Now, the way he described it and the way she describes it in the podcast, it sounded as though he were outside of the home. He says, I can see them through a hole in my living room window. And she says, what are you talking about? He says, well, when I came back this morning, um, my couch was on fire. Now, he, he entered the home. He, he, walked, he was inside the home when she talked to him the first time. I think my theory is once she talked to him the first time and she says to him, we're probably going to be calling the cops because we can't find her. You were the last one that knew where she was. And when he finds out that her husband's with the sheriff's office, he starts to get kind of pan panicked. 
I think that this is at the point where he lights the couch on fire. Now, I could be wrong about that, and I couldn't find anything saying that he had called 911 and at what time of the morning he may have called to report this couch being on fire. The couch burned enough that it was inside the home, and it burned just enough to burn a little um, bit of the floor underneath it, just to, to blacken it. It didn't really do any severe damage. He says that the couch was smoldering. It was on fire. He grabs it, throws it outside in the yard. Then he calls the fire department. This is when he realizes that Brooks' belongings are still there. Now, when the family arrived a little while later, her stuff was outside on the porch. He tells the sister that he's looking at the stuff through the living room window from outside inside. So her belongings were inside that house. He got them and put them out on the porch. What kept him from throwing those items on the couch and trying to burn them as well? I believe the only thing, I believe he, he I believe it was an oversight. I believe he didn't realize that she had these items there and he, in his moment of trying to get rid of her body. Now, this is my own personal opinion. And I want to make sure everyone knows that I'm just, I'm just um, working this in my mind how I see it. And I could be way wrong. But I, I feel like that if he did get rid of her, he probably overlooked those items or planned to come back and take care of that stuff later. Not realizing that her family is going to show up at his house. Probably bring the cops out there. He probably didn't want to throw these items in his truck and drive them back to wherever she was. And so he just left them there. He, he might have thought this will look less suspicious on me if her items are still here. Now the sister also describes that um, they did go out to the house later and her belongings were on the porch and they got them and the police did come and speak with him and you know they have spoken to him several times she explains and They've never been able to build a case against him. They've never been able to find any kind of evidence, which she believes that her phone call to him telling him we're going to be sending the cops out there prompted him to get rid of this couch because it probably did have her hair, her, you know, other DNA on the couch from Brooke and maybe possibly blood, but more than likely it was the... I believe my own thoughts are that he probably raped her on this couch and it's kind of panicked thinking they're going to find DNA. And so now she also explains that where her sister's phone last pinged was in an area called Blue Lick. And she told, she told, she tells the name of the road in the podcast, but I can't remember it right now. But, she says the police tell her that's a three mile that the phone would have pinged in a three mile radius around that area. Now this was roughly about 25 to 30 miles away from this Josh Hensley's house. They, they searched and they tried to search, but in this, the area where the phone would actually have pinged, she describes as being a very wooded very wooded area, not what you might consider a woods of a forest where you can just walk through and enjoy nature, but very dense, thick brush, rocks, cliffs, um, culverts, and snakes, and just very wooded. So it was, a, it was very hard for them to try to even go in there and search. They would have had to have had a lot of help. On a Facebook page that was from 2014, and there's been nothing updated on that page since, it listed him as having worked for the Solid Waste and I think maybe the Road Department. Now, the Solid Waste, if there's people out there that don't know what that is, it's normally what you would consider trash pickup. But they don't just go around and pick up people's trash like on the garbage truck. They also clean up dump sites. They go out and they clean up, um, you know, the highways and stuff and keep the ditches cleaned out and just different, you know, jobs that they do. 
so this was what leads, led me to believe that he may have had access to uh, not only equipment that he might have been able to use to get rid of some items or something that he didn't want, but also that he knew places where they might take, where, the, where people might take stuff to dump it out. And this is just a thought. It's just a theory that, you know, when I saw that he worked for that type of job that led me to think maybe he knew the area well, knew places in the area that other people would have a hard time getting to. Now it's 5.30 in the morning. She had already made plans with some friends that day to go to Somerset, Kentucky to a car show. So it made no sense that she would be going to a party at 5.30 in the morning, knowing that she was going to be going to this car show, meeting up with these friends later that day. Her friends began to con try to contact her when it got time to leave for this car show, and she wasn't around. And they started asking around her family, and everyone said no one had seen her or talked to her since early that morning. This is when they began to try to get a hold of this Joshua Hensley. Um, he said that her ex-boyfriend was supposed to be coming to pick her up, and he didn't feel comfortable. He was afraid that he would confront him and they would have an argument, so he decided to leave. Now, if he knew the ex-boyfriend was coming to pick her up, he was afraid of this guy, which he claimed to have been friends with him, why didn't he just tell her, I'm going to give you a ride to go meet him someplace, and then I've got to be on my way? Um, they hung up the phone, but 20 minutes later, Tasha was calling him back. They ended up going out to his house where they found all of her belongings, including a pair of cowboy boots, her purse, and some clothing. And um, he told her that when he came back that morning, his couch was on fire, that he believed she had dropped a cigarette and lit the couch on fire and that maybe it scared her and she fled from the house leaving her stuff behind. This home was in foreclosure. It had no electricity. This was a place where he took her and he knew that he didn't live there anymore. He knew this home was empty he knew that this was just a place that he was going to take this girl to. This was going to be her last known location. The next day, June the 23rd, Brooklyn's mother files a missing persons report. Brooklyn's family went to the Josh Hensley home to search for her. They found her personal items on his front porch, including her shoes. The only thing that was unaccounted for was the clothing that she was wearing that night and her cell phone. Two days later, on June the 25th, Brooklyn's phone pings off a tower at Blue Lick for the last time ever. Josh, Josh Hensley would later be arrested on possession of child sexual abuse material on August the 5th, 2020. Now, this was not related to her. Now, Joshua Hensley was arrested and charged with possession of child porn. Brooklyn's mother wants to ask him what happened to her daughter. Three men in Madison County were arrested on child sexual exploitation offenses. Now, this is from 2020 as well. Tuesday, the Kentucky State Police Electronic Crime Branch arrested three men on charges related to child sexual abuse material. Joshua Hensley, 30, Brad Helton, 32, and Stephen Pulsford, 61, were arrested after an undercover internet crime investigation. During a search at the three residences in Berea, equipment used to facilitate these crimes were seized and taken to Kentucky State Police Forensic Laboratory. Hensley is currently charged with one count of possession of material portraying a minor in a sexual performance. This is a Class D felony punishable by one to five years in prison. Now, it's 2024. He's probably more than likely no, no longer in jail. 
the, so this Helton was charged with a class C felony, which carries five to 10 years because he was the one apparently sending the material. The other two men were the ones who received the material and they both received uh, class D felonies, one to five years. And I would say more than likely, both of them probably got out in a year or less. The arrests were the result of an Internet Crimes investigation by Internet Crimes Against Children. The Kentucky State Police Crime Branch began the investigation after discovering the suspects promoting the sexual performance of a minor and sharing images of child sexual material. Pulsford is an English professor at Berea College where he is listed in the uh, department's website. It's my belief that this Josh Hensley, who was a little older than these other people, went to this party this night, saw Brooklyn. I don't know if he knew her from before or not. Brooklyn was a small girl. She was tiny. And later it was discovered that he had gone to jail for child pornography material. Now, I think he was attracted to Brooklyn because of her small stature, because she had a small body. So you can kind of get an idea of what I'm talking about here. I think he saw her and he thought she's, he might have thought she was younger than she was. Because she was five foot one, she was very small. She was, that was my own personal observation that. I think he thought she may have been a little younger than she was, or he may have just been attracted to her because she was smaller. And this was a man who later was arrested for child pornography. The, the fire that burnt into the floor did not get out of control. It was extinguished before that, and the fire department did rule this fire suspicious. The homeowner was in the process of moving out. Utilities had been turned off for several weeks. Investigators believe that she probably might have even been taken there against her will. However, she was texting family members and she was texting her ex-boyfriend. So I think that if she had been taken there, and she probably was taken there somewhat against her will, why didn't she tell her family members or her ex-boyfriend at the time that she felt, you know, she did say she was afraid, but why didn't she tell them the extent of what was going on? And maybe someone would have come there. Why didn't she call 911 and just tell them? From the time that Brooklyn arrived at this house, she was constantly on her phone texting family members and her ex-boyfriend trying to get a ride home. So she was desperate wanting a ride home. She didn't go out there to this house with this man willingly. And um, I think she found herself in a very bad situation. And her, her uh, whereabouts are still unknown to this day. 11 years later, she's still, there's been nothing. Kentucky State Police began to conduct interviews, and the owner of the house was amongst them, but nothing about that meeting has ever been publicly released. In the early days of the investigation, police requested that the property owners check their land for any signs of a missing girl. They were told to pay close, close attention to any fresh dug dirt or any ditch lines, remote areas, and if they had any unusual smells, to contact the police. Authorities searched more than 16,000 acres in three Kentucky counties. They conducted large-scale searches in the Red Lick area and Owsley Fork Lake. They searched on horseback and they used cadaver dogs and search dogs. The current theory held by both Brooklyn's family and investigators is that she was abducted. Investigators believe the last text that she sent to her ex-boyfriend 
was actually written and sent by someone else with her phone. Her family believes she wouldn't have left the house on Dillon Court without her belongings. She had no reason to run away or to even walk away from her life. Her sister feels that she needs to be the voice for her sister, and as such, she has conducted interviews about her disappearance. She has taken numerous steps to keep her sister's name in the public eye, and she hopes that someone will come forward with some information. 30-year-old Joshua Hensley was the last person to ever that was known to ever see Brooklyn. Hensley has never been charged in anything to do with her disappearance, and he's never even been named a suspect, which is mind-blowing to me. What is going on with the Madison County Police Department out there in, the, in that Berea, Kentucky area? He was the last known person to see her. Her, her belongings were found in his home. Like I said before, he I believe he burned this couch to get rid of DNA evidence. As in any case like this, especially in a small town, rumors are always running rampant. And there was a website called Topics where people could post anonymously. And um, that website, as far as I know, is no longer in existence. But it was at the time that this happened. Now, someone posted on this website, and they said that they knew a story about um, Brooklyn. And again, I say this is just a rumor. I've heard a lot of incriminating evidence against Josh Hensley, and I honestly believe that he is guilty of this crime. And if anyone knows anything, they should contact the police. They should not have to fear getting into trouble because they could call anonymously and the call would not be traced. But people in the community, if they know anything, they should speak out. So the rumor was that Josh Hensley and an unidentified female were on the side of the road in a car. And apparently the car had run out of gas. They were supposedly out, had run out of gas beside the road, and a man came along, and I guess he asked them if they wanted a ride, and they accepted. At some point, the woman told the man who picked her up that she was afraid of Josh and that she didn't want to get back out of the car with him. The man said that he respected her wishes and that he would not force her out of the car with Josh. Josh was said that it was said that Josh got mad and that he repeatedly tried to make the woman get out of the car, and she wouldn't, and um, they got into an argument, and the woman supposedly told the man that Josh had chopped up Brooklyn Farthing and scattered her, her body all over the place, and so I don't know what became of this woman, and I guess this man that gave her a ride took her and dropped her off somewhere, like everyone said, this was just a rumor, this was on the website Topics, and rumors are running crazy throughout the years of what happened to her. But I think everyone kind of comes to the same conclusion in the long run that this guy did something to her between 4.30 that morning and 5.30. Um, her last text to her boyfriend was probably from him. No one spoke to her that morning saying, let's go to a party in Rockcastle County. There was nothing that they could find in her phone logs or anything like that, suggesting that she was making plans to do anything like that. So I just wanted to add that to this story. Now, I just want to put out a little disclaimer here before I end this video. All the stuff that I've talked about, speculation about what happened to Brooke and this Josh Hensley, it's all just my own theories and thoughts about this. He, he's never been charged with anything. He's, he, he's cooperated as far as the police are concerned. When they've gone to talk to him, he's always come and talked with them. They've never found any evidence of anything that happened to Brooke, and she's just considered a missing person at this case. At this point, her case is still unsolved and open. So I just want to clear that up. I don't want anyone to think that this guy actually, you know, has been 
charged with her murder or anything. It's just rumor, hearsay, and opinion. She got a ride from this Josh Hensley for whatever reason. Maybe she was intoxicated. Maybe she was enjoying his company and just didn't realize what kind of person he really was until it was too late. But whatever happened that night, she ended up at his house. That was confirmed because this other witness, this other guy that was um, at the party, claims that he was dropped off by Josh Hensley first, and then he continued on with Brooklyn. This was the last time that anyone ever saw her again, and n none of her remains have ever been found. Can the Commonwealth Attorney, Commonwealth of Kentucky Attorney, has been seeking information from the case file. They have confirmed their continued interest in the case. Officers have followed countless tips and examined the case file for things that might have been overlooked. The case remains open and active. If you have any information regarding the case of the disappearance of Brooklyn Farthing, you can contact the Kentucky State Police at 859-623-2404. Thanks for watching.